but um, to perhaps add to what you've heard already, uh, maybe we can shift the conversation a little bit away from digital and, and towards uh, therapeutics. So, so uh, my name is uh, Joris. I work at um, uh, the research and development department of, uh, of Novartis. And what R&D departments at um, pharma companies do, obviously, is they put new therapeutics into the company pipeline. Um, and a couple of years ago, they asked, well, uh, because the tools we've been using to create new therapeutics have been you know, chemicals, biologics, uh, cell and gene therapy, and so on and so forth. And a question we had three years ago was, was can we also treat patients with, with digital tools? We didn't call it that at the time. We had no idea. We just had the good fortune to, to run into smart people, as you've heard from earlier, and as you'll uh, hear from uh, in a minute. So that's been our journey. Can, can we treat people with, uh, with software, as David said, software a, as, a, as a treatment? Um, and so when, when we um, at Novartis develop new therapies, um, we always develop a uh, highest level of, of clinical validation and, uh, and of, of quality management, right? Otherwise, it will never pass muster with the regulators. So that's the way we look at digital therapeutics, too. We look at the space of digital therapeutics that has the opportunity to get a label, software that really treats software with high clinical validation to sustain uh, your clinical claims, and that can withstand uh, the quality management test. The way I explain it to my family is, if you're being treated for depression, would you like to be treated by a software that's developed by Philips or Medtronic or uh, Microsoft? And, and that typically gives them uh, the answer. So uh, cl clinical validation, um, high, high quality management. But w what does that mean? Wh where do you start? How do you treat someone with, uh, with software? So um, what really made it interesting for us is when we found that a lot of therapies which have been around for 20, 30 years and which have been proven to work, you can now deliver with digital therapies, with, with digital technologies. So that's why we also sometimes say digital therapeutics is not about digital, it's about the therapeutics. And there are a lot of therapies that we discovered over these past couple of years that we think can be better delivered by digital. Uh, for example, uh, behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. Compare uh, going to see your therapist with having that same kind of quote unquote talk therapy over your phone. Um, there are a range of, of um, more immersive therapies like clinical hypnotherapy. Clinical hypnotherapists work um, at a lot of academic medical centers across the country and across the world. Those therapies can be delivered by VR, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Um, think about a physical therapist. You need to recover um, after surgery or um, you're regaining function after uh, 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 osteoporosis or, or whatever bone or, or muscle disease. You can do the f physical therapy at home via a gaming console. You don't need to go out and go see your physical therapist. Um, there's also a lot of, of technologies emerging now that can uh, deliver um, um, electrical pulses for nerve stimulation or for very targeted stimulation of particular uh, neuronal activity. Uh, again, has been around for many, many years, um, uh, 50 years or so at that time. The machines were really clunky, so you've probably seen them more in, in, in black and white horror movies than, than at your ac actual doctor's office. But the technology has um, advanced to the extent that you now have consumables that can trigger a very targeted effect by tri triggering a very targeted nerve response um, or particular neuronal activity. Biofeedback is um, uh, combining these digital therapeutic technologies with the ever emerging range of, of sensors. Uh, uh, traditional sensors or, or new sensors. Think, think of um, ADHD therapy, where you're training a child basically to, to chill. I, I apologize for the oversimplification. Um, and, and typically, you send the child home. But now with biofeedback, you can actually measure how stressed out they are, and you can expose them to real-life situations on any of these technologies you saw before, on, the, on an iPad, on a phone, in VR, on a gaming console, and you can measure how stressed they are and you can adjust the content to how well they are applying what you just taught them. Again, biofeedback, neurofeedback have been around for 50 years. It was just so clumsy to, to, uh, uh, to deliver that it, uh, it, uh, it never gained a lot of traction. And that same concept, creating feedback loop with novel sensors, that doesn't necessarily uh, limit itself to the delivery of of face-to-face uh, -face therapy. Um, this is an example of, uh, of uh, a custom-built artificial pharmacy system. So you can use all that information and the software can then decide what the dosing of your, of your treatment should be. So a, a big realm of already clinically proven therapeutic interventions that have been around for decades, which you can now deliver to, uh, through digital infrastructure. And why would you do that? Three reasons that we sought to do that. 
One is access engagement and related to that is stigma. As I just mentioned, uh, uh, compare going to see your therapist versus whipping up your phone. Um, it's much easier to, uh, uh, to access a, a, an app on your phone. You don't have to explain the environment around you while you're taking off three hours from work to go see a therapist. So it also reduces stigma. Uh, we've heard from some of the patients that we worked with in our clinical trial wh whether we could also um, uh, add audio only features because they said we like to practice when we are on the bus but we don't want the person next to us seeing that, seeing that I'm being treated for, treated for a mental health disorder. So it, it vastly improves this access engagement. We heard from, from David, we're seeing the, the same, uh, the same uh, trends that uh, 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 a digital application can be much more engaging than a, uh, than a therapist and, and no uh, disrespect to therapists. The second is quality control. Literature suggests that a face-to-face -face delivered therapy, the quality thereof, is um, really dependent on what therapist you're having and what kind of day your therapist is having. So the quality is very, very variable. And digital is always the same, it's always controlled. There's no data whatsoever to suggest that digitally delivered therapy is better than uh, uh, the best face-to-face uh, -face therapist or hopefully is better than the worst, but it's always the same. So you have much more control over quality. And, and thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, and we heard this from David a bit as well, is opportunities for personalization. If you ask me today, let's take a Novartis drug, Gilenia for MS. If you, if you ask me, how are all your patients doing? I have no clue. I need to set up a patient registry or a, a, a phase four study or whatever. If you ask Corey or David, how are all your patients on your therapy doing? Uh, I probably have a dashboard on, <laughs> on their smartphone to tell us. The, the point is, digital therapy is a, c is a connected therapy. So you know how everyone is doing. So you have a unique opportunity to use that feedback loop to drive real world performance of your therapy. Digital therapy is the first time that literally the therapy can get be better with every single patient that you treat. So that's why we were excited about it. Um, and this is a quote from the annual report. I was like, yeah, we made it to the annual report. But uh, to me, the importance is not only that we were there, but that Novartis positioned it really as a therapy along with all the other therapeutics that we've done. So that was a little bit the background why we were interested. We had no clue how to do it. So we were very lucky to uh, meet Corey from, uh, from Pair Therapeutics. Corey and I were separated after birth. Uh, he got all the wits and the charm, and I get to introduce <laughs> him here. So Corey's gonna talk a little bit about our partnership. Thanks, Joris. Uh, so as Joris mentioned, uh, we have the privilege at Paratherapeutics of being a partner with Novartis as well as with Joris. And if there's one thing that I've learned throughout multiple rounds of working together, it's that the two of us cannot fit on this stage at the same time. <laughs> so you'll see us shuffle back and forth. Um, when you think about this space of digital therapeutics, or as we specifically like to refer to them as prescription digital therapeutics or PDTs, just like a drug, we walk these products through a phase one, two, three clinical trial paradigm. So what does that mean? That means that in phase one, we're looking for things like safety, dose, and the beginnings of usability. Phase two, we're looking for some sort of proof of efficacy in a way that we can convince ourselves it's worth running a phase three clinical study. And in phase three, we're looking for some degree of data which is submittable to the regulatory bodies in order to support both safety and efficacy of the products. I think with that general frame, uh, we were able to do two deals across four assets with two different parts of Novartis. And you can just see some of the headlines here. Uh, on the earlier stage, so in discovery and clinical stage, uh, we partnered with Joris's team at Nibber, uh, the Novartis Institute of Biomedical Research, to develop two new assets. Uh, so one is a discovery stage collaboration to build a prescription digital therapeutic to treat patients with multiple sclerosis. The second is a development stage collaboration to treat patients with schizophrenia. And so just to unpack those terms a bit, um, these are terms of art that you would tend to find in the pharma space. Discovery means that we are good at building PDTs. Novartis is good at treating patients with MS. We came together to build one of these products anew. A development stage deal means that we have an asset that has the beginnings of efficacy. So in pharma parlance, I would call this about a phase 2A asset. The asset had efficacy data for treating patients with schizophrenia, but we did not have a sufficient amount of safety and efficacy data to file for regulatory approval. So we partnered with the team at Nibber in order to run the pivotal clinical studies and bring the product to market together. So that's the deal on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, the deal on the right-hand side of the screen is a separate two-asset deal 
with the Sandoz portion of Novartis. And so for this particular deal, uh, I would phrase this as a commercial stage deal. Uh, we had two late stage assets, or rather have two late stage assets, and these are the first two prescription digital therapeutics. So Reset was the first piece of software ever approved by the FDA to treat any disease. That product is a monotherapy to treat addiction related to alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, and stimulants. And the Reset O product is the first prescription digital therapeutic to receive breakthrough designation. Uh, it is also the first drug software combination. That product is specifically designed to treat patients with opiate use disorder when used in combination with a medication called buprenorphine. Um, why is this so exciting? To me, this is so exciting because this is the first time that pharma has ever sold a piece of software. And um, I'm sure that we'll have some conversations after this and I'll have to refine that statement, but this is the first time that pharma has ever sold a piece of therapeutic software. And so just like you would commercialize a drug, we have a field force that's out there. That field force is helping clinicians to understand the medical value inherent in writing the scripts. They're helping patients to use the product, and we have built what we call our Pair Connect service, which is the first patient support center that does things like adjudicate claims, uh, deal with clinicians, and support patients who are on the product. Um, so this is, in a very brief slide, uh, really all of the types of deals that you would expect to see in the, in the pharma world. You'd expect to see discovery stage deals, that's MS. You would expect to see development stage deals, that's schizophrenia and you would expect to see commercial stage deals, that is substance use disorder and opiate use disorder respectively. So I think with uh, all of that work done, and I should say that we are currently uh, in the throes of our launch, and so it's, it's a busy time for both companies, um, it begs the provocative question, uh, what in the world have we learned? And I would put this really into four actionable buckets. Um, I think number one, uh, this is a space which is characterized by all of the clinical rigor that you would traditionally expect for a drug product. That means that we generate both safety and efficacy in randomized clinical studies. Uh, and it means that we are running trials that look just like trials that you would expect to see for a drug. They have all of the same rigors. They have a control arm. They use the exact same endpoints as you would expect to see for a drug. And really, that's the degree of rigor which is appreciated by the FDA. It's the degree of rigor which is appreciated by payers, and it's the degree of rigor which is demanded by providers. Uh, I think the second lesson uh, that we learned is really that this is a time for active collaboration uh, with regulatory bodies, and specifically speaking, the FDA. Uh, we have the distinct privilege of being a member of the FDA's pre-certification committee, uh, and this is really a group that is tasked with trying to set the ground rules for the regulation of prescription digital therapeutics. Uh, we are the token small company, or one of the token small companies, and so we get to sit in a room with companies like Apple, Google, Samsung, Roche, J&J, &J, and Tiny uh, Pair Therapeutics has a seat at the table to be able to define what are the standards of quality and what are the standards of clinical evidence, in bringing assets in this space forward. Uh, I think maybe the third lesson that we've learned is that payers aren't quite as scary as we thought they were. Uh, payers have a huge need in the treatment of these patients. They currently are only able to treat the patients with face-to-face -face care, and that is a non-cost-effective, non-scalable means of caring for the patients. And so, whereas we thought we were gonna hear a tremendous amount of payer pushback, because frankly, payers push back on everything, uh, we've actually seen payers embrace these technologies and to that end, uh, be very eager for us to use the engagement and the real world efficacy data that we collect with every single therapeutic product in order to understand how their patients are doing in the real world. Um, and I think that tees up uh, maybe what is the most exciting thing about the space which is that we're able to use those, those real-world data points in order to continue to modify and enhance these products in the real world. And I think just to give an extreme example, uh, my team often likes to say that today's version of Reset is the worst version of Reset patients will ever see. And what that means is that every patient who interacts with the product gives us the opportunity to continue to enhance the product, and we are then married to a set of quality standards where there's a relationship with the regulator so that we understand the types of changes that we can and cannot make, 
while staying within the bounds of both safety and efficacy. So I think with, uh, with all of those lessons learned, uh, I would say that this is an incredibly interesting time for digital therapeutics and specifically for prescription digital therapeutics. And this is really the first time that biology and, uh, and technology have come together in a way which has the power to redefine standards of efficacy, not just in disorders of the brain, but really across therapeutic areas. And at PAIR, uh, we are laser focused on developing our lead assets, uh, but also developing the entirety of this space to be able to bring these technologies to patients. And so I think with, uh, with all of that said, I'm gonna vacate the stage and turn it back to Yoris. Thanks, Corey. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, last point I wanted to just add is you heard from Novartis Pair Partnership, but both of us completely rely on partnership with AWS. And I wanted to highlight why that's so essential to us. So again, if you forget about digital for a little bit and think about therapeutics, in the non-digital world, you can go to any Walgreens, Rite Aid, CVS, wherever you go, you can find anything and everything for your health, right? You can find healthy foods, you can find nutritional supplements, you can get your flu shots, you can find your uh, over-the-counter medicine, uh, you can pick up your prescription. Um, there will be a world um, where we will see the same version in the digital health world. Um, it'll take some time, but it'll get there. So what are the core uh, uh, critical success factors for that digital version of your, your local pharmacy? First is convenience. Uh, convenience to patients. Convenience to providers. Um, they only have so much time in their day to see a lot of patients, and uh, it must be convenient and easy for them to prescribe these novel class of, uh, of therapies. But again, there will be a world in which anyone who is diagnosed with diabetes, depression, schizophrenia gets one prescription, that prescription goes to the cloud, and from the cloud goes to the patient everything they need to treat their disease. Their pharmacotherapy, their digital therapeutic, maybe a device to measure their progress, maybe a device for VR or whatever kind of intervention, but that convenience, one prescription, one box you get at home, um, it will come. And I'll leave it to you to speculate where that one box will come from. Um, but you know, you've seen what's happening in the market, so I think AWS is in a perfect uh, position to, uh, 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 to be that partner. Second is performance. Sometimes we take performance for granted, particularly in a room like this. But let's be honest, Am Amazon and AWS is still our, our benchmark for performance, right? Performance, it, it, can you imagine being treated for schizophrenia and your app is too slow? That's just not, not acceptable, right? It's like going to see your therapist and he suddenly speaks a different language. Um, so really critical to our success. Both Corey and I mentioned that we can drive uh, real performance by personalization of the therapeutic content. We need those insights. Not just how did you like your uh, therapeutic session with your app rated on a one to five, but where have you been? Since l between last Thursday and Sunday evening, how much time did you spend in your, inside your home versus outside seeing friends, which apparently is a marker for depression. What have you been shopping for? What have you been looking for? We need that comprehensive patient insight to drive real world performance of digital therapeutics. And last but absolutely not least, trust is probably the biggest stake I would say we all have in this game. We cannot afford to betray patient's trust. We cannot afford to use data for anything other than what they have explicitly consented for, what they have informed and knowingly consented for. So let's all work together to never ever betray the trust of the patients we collectively serve. And thank you so much, Lisa, for inviting us.